This is the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Fur Neiman. If you're looking to generate wealth and passive income in the lucrative world of mobile home parks, you're in the right place. You'll discover solutions to the common legal and operational pitfalls and how to optimize parks to maximize income. Your host is in the trenches. He's a real estate attorney, financial analyst, and mobile home park investor and operator. Now, let's turn it over to Ferd Neiman. Welcome back, Mobile Home Park Nation. Ferd Neiman here again today with another episode of the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast. Today, I'm going to talk about hiring and about kind of a hiring plan that we've recently put in place. A lot of this I've got out of some good books. Uh, Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey is a great book. And then Matthew Kelly's got a great book on the culture solution, how to build a dynamic culture, lots of other good books and resources on hiring. I feel like this has gotten really tough. Uh, I mean, it gets tough as you grow an organization, but it's really tough in the current economic environment. I mean, there's a large portion of our population that is sitting at home right now watching soap operas or YouTube videos or something. And they don't want to work. And unfortunately, macroeconomic conditions have led to a, an environment where you now have to pay someone $15 an hour to fill your cup of Coke at McDonald's. And, and even then, it's not very good service. I was in McDonald's the other day in Des Moines looking at one of our parks, and there was three of us there. And two of us ordered a fry. The other guy didn't order fry. So I opened the bag, and we went inside. There's nobody else there. It's empty store, and it's like half under construction, so presumably we should get A-plus service. Two people were at the register, and I look back in my bag. I only got one fry, so I'm missing a fry. I say, they all walk away. I start hollering, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. I whistle. I get their attention. The lady from the drive through sees me, comes over, and says, what's up? And I said, I didn't get my other fry. Right then, the guy who took my order comes out. He goes, you didn't get your fry? Okay. They walk over to the other lady, who was the one that handed me my bag, and they, they're all just standing there on their phones. By now, there are two other people who are the cooks, because there's no one else in the stores. There's five employees standing there by the fry machine. So I, at first, I assume that they're waiting for more fries to cook. But no, they were just doing nothing. I go over there and I get their attention, and, and they and the two people who I spoke with in round two of this example looked at the third person and said, "Did you get his fry? He said he needed more fries." And she goes, "No." And they just all kind of looked put out, like somebody's got to actually fill the fries to bring them to me. And then they have the audacity on the receipt now to ask me to tip them as I dine in to pick up my McDonald's. And these people who are worth the old minimum wage, in my opinion, are making $15 an hour, and five of them can't get a french fry. And that's the challenge in the mobile home park industry right now, because I think the most important job in the mobile home park industry is the property manager job, and it's probably the toughest. It's got hard turnover, uh, high turnover, excuse me. You've got days like today where it's 12 degrees and snowing and icy. You've got water pipes to freak, uh, freeze. You've got days where it's 110 degrees. You've got rain. You've got mud. You've got, you know, overseeing the cleaning and the, in, and the infill and the permits and the sales and the application paperwork and the bank paperwork, you know, supply runs, meet, dealing with the B team of vendors because it's hard to pay for the $35 an hour union contractor in this business. So you, you end up a lot of times paying for the schmo and not the pro, but the schmoes, they can get their job done some, but they, they're they a little harder to manage. They don't always show up on time. They don't always show up sober. They don't know how to fill their time cards. They don't have tools. Um, it's continual, continual challenge. Um, and the fact that you can be a one-fifth of a French fry team at $15 a pop means we got to pay more, right? We got to pay 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour. And I've had some pain with this where I've paid people 20 plus dollars an hour, but I want to I want to motivate them by them commissions. So I'll pay them a higher wage cuz that's what the market is, but I want to motiva- motivate them by commissions, but some of these people used to be the french fry gal making 11 dollars an hour, but the market said they're worth 15 so we can get them at 20, but their skills are at 11. And their skills are probably less than 11, which is why they're putting robots in McDonald's now to do these jobs. 
unfortunately not at the Des Moines location. Um, so what do we do? We, we pay them more base salary, but then what do they sometimes do? They, they don't have the motivation for commissions. I had to pinch hit for two of my management staff that were unwilling to do Saturday, that are leaving us, that had, were unwilling to do a Saturday showing. Well, guess what? Most people who work, who can buy homes, work Monday through Friday. So they're available evenings and Saturdays. That's when you should have a lot of your showings. I've sold many houses. I've had good staff sell many houses on Saturday open houses. I had no one else to do it this last Saturday, so I went there and said, I'm going to do this myself. I've had four houses sitting there for like three months, which is unbelievable. And I went there, and I've got like five or six applications, and they all haven't been approved yet. But in two hours of my time, I'm probably going to move four houses. I don't really want to be back as a property manager. I don't really want to be selling mobile homes. But if I can infill an occupied lot that seemingly the other person couldn't, it's going to add 50000 of value to my park. So it is a pretty good day's work. It's just frustrating that we can't get the right people some of the time. I have some great staff, but then I have some staff that I've invited to leave, if you will. And some of the, and I've had some staff that choose to leave when given performance improvement plans, when given accountability measures, when, been, when been, frankly been given adult behavior as to where they need to improve. So I've done a kind of a revamp on hire slow, fire fast. Um, I've had to fire people who have been here for three days, um, unfortunately. But part of that's our fault, my fault, for not hiring slower. What tends to happen is you got a stack of paper on your desk and it's building up, building up to your stress. I need to get some help. So you decide you're going to hire somebody. And then what happens is you take time interviewing and more interviewing and now the stack gets bigger. So then you really need somebody to help you. So then you got two stacks. So you hire the wrong person or you hire fast. That person comes in, you give them one of the stacks and they botch it. They lose stuff. They're, they're unorganized. They're not not as competent as you'd like. They're not as organized as you like, et cetera. And all they do is create problems. So then you've got to get rid of them. And now you've got two stacks plus fixing the errors on stack number two, plus your own stack got bigger because you've got other fish to fry that keep showing up. So I've really gone to a, a hiring plan that we're just now rolling out. But I'll just briefly I'll touch on it, and then I'll just touch on what makes a good property manager. And if you are desiring to be a property manager or if you're at a property manager at a company you're unhappy with i'd love to talk to you we have parks in missouri illinois iowa kansas nebraska we're expanding into north dakota probably expand into indiana and oklahoma and some other neighboring states wisconsin michigan perhaps in the next year or two so think about it so Here's just some skills that I think are good for, for most all employees, but particularly the property manager positions. I want somebody that's organized. That's crucial. Somebody who's tough because there's an outside component. I don't need an inside dog. I need an outside dog for this job. I've been tempted to remove the chairs from the manager's offices to make it clear that you're supposed to be out on your feet, overseeing the vendors, getting supplies, overseeing permits, construction, concrete, doing sales, walking and talking, knocking on doors for collections. Um, I haven't actually taken away the chairs, but I've thought about it. I need somebody that can hustle. I need somebody that wants to work long hours. I want somebody who's got some drive, ambition, somebody that wants to uh, eat what they kill on commissions. I'd much rather pay somebody 30000 base and 30000 in commissions than pay somebody 40000 base. And what I've found is the, the, the guy or gal that will take the lower base is hungry for commissions, and they're my best players. I need somebody who's a people person that helps with the sales component, that make that helps they're typically likable. Um, if you're a people person, you're probably a better communicator. You can build rapport with people. You're probably better at collections. Um, if you're my accountant, I don't really care if you're introverted, but if you're a property manager, it probably helps to be extroverted. Um, there's been, we've had some that are some that are good that are female, some that are male, some that are young, some that are old. So. I don't think there's a, you know, a personality trait or age gender is, is going to give you a one up on this. I think it's just what your underlying characteristics are. And is it the right fit? Is it the right job? So, again, the property management position 
is pretty important, uh, very important. And people ask sometimes, where do you pay these positions? The old model was about $10 per occupied lot per month. Okay, but that's for market part greeter, in my opinion. So, like, if you've got 50 pads, it's only $500 a month. That's 6000 a year. Clearly, you're not going to get somebody, unless you're lucky, for 6000 a year with all the skills and traits that I described. So, more normal is a base plus lot fee or plus commissions. We've got some parks that are very simple uh, where we've got a guy or gal making less than $250 a month total. And typically we're a smaller park or there's you know there's not water meters, there's no park owned homes, they're stable, you know, city water, city sewer, direct bill, that kind of stuff. I've got other parks where we got people in the half time, you know, fifteen hundred a month range, and then more full time, three, four thousand a month, and then with commissions they can make, you know, four or five, six thousand a month, which is pretty significant. Those are gonna be properties that have heavy infill more sales, more park-owned homes, overseeing some vendors, things like that. So the range is all over the place for a property manager, and they can sometimes supervise one, two, sometimes three or four properties, depending on the geographic footprint. But important to get the right people. Um, I just rolled out a 12 steps to a proper hire, and this is largely just copied off of Dave Ramsey's company. It's been very successful, and we've tweaked it some ourselves, and... Here's the 12 steps. Uh, pray. If you're, I'm a faith-filled guy. Uh, sometimes you feel like you need to pray to find that you're not, you need to, but you do, right? Uh, sometimes I feel like the only way to get somebody is to just pray for the right person. Sometimes they show up uh, when you least expect them. Sometimes they don't show up yet, and there's a reason for that. It allows somebody else to step up. Um, sometimes you've got to see, you know, what you can do. I've had people that show up, and you're just like, this person be awesome and they're not i've had people that i'm like yeah i'm not sure and they do they are awesome so it's it's kind of um hard to judge a book by its cover but obviously the regular interview process is you gotta try to do the normal process but what's the normal process have a role description which is a fancy word for a job description is what role is this job gonna have this person gonna have it should be written down have certain bullets and you should have key results areas key performance indicators um, you know, in property management, it's things like 95% collection ratio. You've got to worry about project management, customer service, sales, project management. Those are the key ones. There's lots of other pieces of work from reports and learning to use rent manager and posting ads and sales language and applications and property inspections and all that kind of stuff. But the blocking and tackling of property management can be, you know, put down about those five tasks. Um, you know, get a person's resume i mean that's part of the process get their resume it's a good way to filter people out and i've had a ton of applicants for uh manager property manager jobs and then on the law division our law jobs where people just don't have the skills or the experience that, that are required so i have one job right now that's open for a lawyer minimum three years real estate experience real estate law experience and you have to be a lawyer and you have to be licensed in Missouri or be licensed in another state and willing to come to Missouri because that's our headquarters. I have people apply who are legal assistants. And, I, and then it ends up at my desk and I'm like, what the heck? You're not a lawyer. Oh, but I'm really good. I, I know the law. So we started putting kind of a trick question, if you will, in the bottom just saying, please verify by in, in addition to hitting easy apply on linkedin or indeed please verify that you're qualified by sending an email to this email address to my assistant clarifying and stating yes i read the job description i know the location i meet the minimum requirements here's my resume attached to prove to you that i read all the way to the bottom and here are my salary expectations and yet and or yes they're in alignment with the posting so that's what the resume is helpful for we are doing a numerous interview process, um, a kind of a culture interview first with somebody that's not in the hiring position. So like if I'm the guy with two stacks of paper on my desk, I'm probably not the right person to make this decision, at least not unilaterally, because I'm biased. I want somebody to help with the stack. So we have somebody else to look for like a culture fit and then numerous other layers of interviews to make it more difficult, to weed out people and to really get a feel. Because in, turnover is way worse than just waiting for the right, you know, having not having the person here is a pain. But hiring the wrong person and then having to fire them or they quit and then do it all over again is a bigger pain. 
part of this is you can make them during the interview process do a personality test, like a disc assessment or something. Um, we we have done that historically after you're hired, but it makes sense I think to do it before you're hired. So we're recently rolling that out. Next, do you like them personally? I mean, the more interviews you have, the more people can say, I just don't, this person's mean, or this person is fake or something. So just to try to get a better feel. And part of it is see how they talk about the position. If they're like, yeah, I'm kind of a real estate lawyer, it's boring. I'm like, okay. Or they're like, I love real estate law. I helped on this. Let me tell you about my transaction history. Let me tell you about how I helped my client on this. Like, all right. This person lights up. Obviously, the next one of the other key variables here is you got to talk about at some point how we compensate compensate salary. Um, you know, is there base pay? There's benefits, bonus plan. You know, if you're a lawyer, do you get credit for origination of new clients, things like that. So that's part of the discussion. One thing I like to do too, and Dave Ramsey is obviously a big part of this, is do a personal budget review. I tell people during the interview process, like it'd be my my goal if everybody had a salary of zero. And not just because I'm paying the salary, but if the salary is zero, but a compensation plan with a target compensation of 2x if they meet the following deliverables. And that way, if everybody motivated to perform, everybody would make more money, but that extra money would be like free to me because they would be performing at a higher level. But I recognize a lot of people can't do the zero salary, right? So I'll tell people like, look, if you want the job, I'll give you 40000 I'll give you $10,000 bonus package if you, follow, if you do the following. Or... If you choose, take a $30,000 base, I'll increase your bonus package up to 60000 if you do the exact same following. Well, some people are like, I can't take the $30,000 salary. I got bills, I've got child support, blah, blah, blah. I need thirty nine eight. And so then that's, that's the structure is better for you. I don't want you out there feeling like you got to mow grass on weekends just to feed your kids. I want you, because your personal life, if you have problems, and most people's personal lives, the biggest problems, Think about divorce. The divorce ratio is like 50% in this country. The number one problem is money problems, not infidelity or not other. It's fi fighting for money. So if you're having personal problems at home because you're over your skis on your budget, that's going to impact your job. And if you're having a problem at work because your job's not satisfying or it's beating you up, you're going to have personal problems at home. The work-life balance myth is a myth. Read the book uh, Off Balance by Matthew Kelly. It goes into that in detail. All right, so we go over the budget. Um, references, calling references is something that's hard to do. I mean, I, I mean, it's, not, it's easy to do, but like I, I've been lazy about it in the past. Like, oh, I don't need to call a reference. It bites me in the butt. So I'm calling references at this point because they can they can make or break a deal sometimes. Even though it's kind of like an idiot test, because like who's going to give you a reference of someone that's going to give them a bad recommendation? But the, I've had references like, yeah. Bill worked for me. He was all right. Oh, he's applying for a new job again. Like what? So that's that help. That's helpful. And then the next is share your mission statement. We just went through this process um, as part of that book, The Culture Solution. Coming up with a mission statement, which got a lot of team feedback on, and then identify our core values. And this is good for culture fit. Uh, for example, I'm Catholic. Our company is Christian-based. You know, we tithe 10% of our income. We we donate money. We donate time. We volunteer. We, we have a regular prayer life. Go to church on Sunday. But you don't have to be a Christian to be here. We have several people who are atheists. I don't think we have any... Well, we have some other religions. I don't, I don't even know all the religions, frankly, because it's not required to be what religion you are here. But we're not going to donate to Planned Parenthood, for example. I have to change credit cards because I'm not going to donate to a company that funds abortion. So, like, we're not going to, we don't have Pepsi. The company's not buying Pepsi in the fridge because Pepsi donates to Planned Parenthood. So that's part of my leadership as company culture fit. If you don't like that, that's that's fine, but don't ask me to put Pepsi in the company fridge. Um, so part of the culture fit is I had a woman lately, recently, she left. She's like, I don't really agree with some of these core values. And if she's atheist, like, okay, you can leave. We're not going to force feed it to you. But at the same time, we're going to treat people like the golden rule, treat people like we treated. Um, that's part of the Christian ethos. So I'm kind of going for that. Um, if you don't want to be part of that, that's your call. But go somewhere else, right? So part of this is part of the original vetting. You've been listening to the Mobile Home Park Lawyer Podcast with Ferd Neiman. Ready to learn more? Go to www.themobilehomelawyer.com. 
for free resources and materials to help you succeed. If you love the podcast, go to Apple Podcasts, give us your review and subscribe today. Thank you for listening. Neither the Supreme Court of Missouri nor the Missouri Bar reviews nor approves certifying organizations or specialist designations. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements.